spot like TV and radio as you can see every Saturday morning I'll be on radio too. steal a spotlight right here WELT we encourage local talent on 95.7 FM on your radio dial now let me roll right into another episode you can see we're here in the studio and we're lining up sponsors very grateful for the community support outpouring the love I have millions of fans on inmate to roommate on A&E thank you A&E Sharp Entertainment shout out to Joe Ruser Stay tuned, here we come, another episode of Steal a Spotlight. Crime, punishment, machine guns, violence, silencers, bad guys, violent crime, HIDA, task force, undercover, ATF agent, Ignacio Esteban, now live. Welcome to William Steel, True Crime. Here we go with another adventure in true crime from the inside. We have a very special guest with us again. And this guy has graced the uh, stage here many times. He's going to be one of my first guests on Steal a Spotlight TV show. Uh, some clips from these interviews are going to be going up here soon when we start airing that TV show. But anyway, you guys, many of my fans know him. His name is Ignacio Esteban. He's a retired ATF agent. Many years, I believe it's over 20 some odd years, if I remember correctly. Um, mm -hmm. ATF Undercover is, is, is his autobiography. We're going to go into that now. It's incredible. I just listened to it with uh, my fiance, and it's a really interesting book about the inner workings of ATF and the cases he's worked on and some of the serious issues within uh, some management of ATF. Yes. And so he's going to get into some of that with us today. Uh, real quick, my fans of Inmate to Roommate, thank you. No news yet on the second season. Mm -hmm. Contact the network. And if even if I know concretely, I'm not allowed to say, but <laughs> with, uh, you know, approaching 11.2 million views on TikTok alone, one platform, you know, you could only imagine it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, there's room for more. So fans are screaming for it. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely all in if they decide to do it. Thank you for joining us, Ignacio. So here we are. Right, Quinty, tell us a little bit about your background and let's get into this book. This is a phenomenal book you have out about your life. Uh, oh, I, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Congratulations you. on your show and your success. That's that's Thank fantastic. You. Thank o you so much. Over 11 million counting. Outstanding. Okay. <laughs> yes, now, I, I, I'm glad uh, you and Mary like, like the Audible sign. It, it just came out a few weeks ago. I had the ATF Undercover published uh, last February. And uh, shout out to Sean Milo. He's a voice actor. Uh, he's done a lot of books. He did some with uh, Matt Cox, which I also did. Shout out to him. A show of his uh, just came out. And he recommended him. I listened to stuff. He's done a lot of his stuff. And uh, he's doing, uh, he did ATF Undercover, did a great job. And I got two more books he's going to be working on also. And it's going to be lengthy books on organized crime. And the other one has to do with tyrants and the worst mass killers uh, in this century. So both are excellent, excellent books. I think, I you, like, uh, yeah, uh, didn't you just release that one as a, as a short, uh, like a few days ago? Or Those, those are long books. Those are long books. Short one as well? Okay. Yeah, yeah, those, I, guess, I, have yeah I have long books for those who like lengthy reading, and I got short books for those who just want a specific topic. You know, if you just want to do one specific group, like a Hell's Angels or an Outlaw, if you want an encompass book over 300 pages, I, I have the one with the, the most dangerous crime syndicates of our time. And, and that's also how I'm going to do it. So both of them, you have the shorts, the medium, and the long ones. So it depends on which ones you have. And all my books are free for Kindle Unlimited subscribers. And they'll all under ten dollars. Even the long ones are like nine nine nine. So very reasonable price on Amazon. So please enjoy those books. Yeah, check out his books. All the, the uh, some book images will be popping up here soon, as well as links in the description directly to his books. Um, Ignacio, so we heard the book okay. uh, from end to end, fascinating. You know, I was uh, pretty much unfortunately on the path to being you know career criminal type guy, and I. You know, change my ways. I come out. I try to help people now. You know, through my pl platform, and I, I'm very honored to have you as a guest all the time. I appreciate. It. Thanks for having me. Yep. So some of the things that I've heard happen because I was a law clerk in prison. You know, you kind of flesh them out behind the scenes. What's going on? Tell us about your book and some of the important cases. The message in your book. The over the overarching message from your time in ATF. Yeah. Yeah. I I, uh, I wrote the book. I started writing the book. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, which was in, in March 2021, I was in ATF headquarters, and uh, you know we started working from home. You know the country is 
I think I mentioned the other show, you know, no, no people are dying and, uh, and the director of the time said, do something that will keep you preoccupied, something positive that doesn't consume you because people are getting consumed by this, right? Remember how people were consumed, the, 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 you know, the sky is falling, this is the end of the world right here type of situation. So I just started dabbling on my book and I had called it the, my ATF life. And I just started talking about my life, how I started and everything else. Cause I always like writing. I write a lot of my chapters and, and I also like writing uh, obviously with my reports. I used to do a lot of report writing, with my cases and everything else. So I started, but then I got really busy when things picked up. So I had to put it on the side and I would retire in the summer of 2021 after 26 years of federal law enforcement. I retired. I took a nice vacation with my family, went across the country, uh, drove all the way to South Dakota and Wyoming, uh, saw the Badlands, the Black Mountains, Mount Rushmore. And, and that really inspired me. When I came back, I felt like I, I wanted to do some, some writing and stuff. So I did political books on China, I did uh, ATF Fast and Furious, and then I really started diving into my autobiography, which I called ATF Undercover. I could have called it the accidental agent, and I think we talked about sure why, but I decided to keep it undercover. All, all my years of undercover cases, you know, dealing with repeat violent offenders, dealing with gang members, the international traffickers, armed home invaders, domestic traffickers, murder for hire cases, uh, armed drug dealers. I mean, we deal, ATF deals with the worst of the worst kind of criminals. And uh, it, it's, I, I think it's a really interesting case. It's not just about, you know, buying drugs and guns, right? Dope and guns. It's also about my life, my personal life, uh, what happens, how I get there. Um, you know, one thing I'll talk about is, uh, you know, when I first got married, right? I, I dealt with, and this is something very private, and I really don't talk much about it, but I think it's important to put out there since I think you listen to it there. Um, I had just got married. I had met my wife. She was also a listen law enforcement with uh, FDLE. And uh, uh, we met. I had proposed to her in Venice, in Italy. It was amazing, right, out there. If you haven't been to uh, Venice during Carnival uh, with the Venetian flog, that is just an amazing experience to have. <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been in prison a long time. That's on my bucket list. <laughs> Very romantic. Proposed her there. And uh, we were married about seven, eight months later. This is 2006. Uh, so, you know, you, you heard this term from Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, yes. right? Just got married, a beautiful wife, right? I'm, uh, and I have a great career in law enforcement. And I come back and my dad was a very healthy man. So I get a little background by my father, a very healthy man. He, he was a cyclist, didn't drink much, didn't smoke at all. Um, and uh, he was having complaint from back pains, a lot of back pains. And sometimes you know, people make mistakes. They may skip a year or two from going to the doctor. And I always tell people, be proactive with your health and never skip a physical. Try to get all your blood work done as soon as you can because you never know it could save your life. Right. And by the time he did go see a doctor uh, because uh, he had severe, severe back pain, couldn't sleep and everything else, uh, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Wow. Yeah. And, 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 and he, he was a man in his mid-60s, right? That's generally very fast-moving uh uh, it's horrific, horrible, yeah. hor horrible, horrible, horrible. You go from a healthy looking person to skin and bones with like, like six, seven months. Wow. The, the, the cure, you know, the chemo is worse than the disease. It destroys you so so much faster. Uh, so th those were tough things I talk about. And I talk about things people to, should try to do to fight pancreatic cancer. I mean, obviously, uh, a lot of people remember what happened to Alex Trebek. He right. had pancreatic cancer, but it's different. It's been, it's been over 15 years, right? Medicine's treatment. He was able to function. And go to work on Jeopardy, right? Uh, I'll, I'll, when you got that man, it was like downhill right. done. He never, never enjoyed a day of retirement in his life. He worked his whole life because he was going to retire uh, around seventy. Ne never got there. He was an engineer, uh, very, very, very good. He worked at uh, Bertram Yachts, and in, in Miami, it makes beautiful, you know, beautiful, amazing yachts. Uh, and it wasn't able to uh, enjoy his retirement. I so remember. I'm thankful enough I had to retire and do and things that. You know, the people cannot do because you never know. Never yeah, assume you will have that next day. So that's that's in it too personally about my life and how difficult it was because you had to deal with <clears throat> the, my caseload. I was in Tampa. They were in Miami, right? So I had to go back and forth. I had a new wife. So I talk about these issues and how you have to adapt and overcome. And, as, you know, one of the hardest episodes to go there to see your family okay. deteriorate in front of you, not only your father, but the impact I had my mother and my other family members. It's, it's horrific, and, and that's, that's a pretty horrible way to die uh, is to die like that slowly, six, seven months. So 
very difficult situation there. Very difficult. So then, so we're looking at 2007. My father passes later that year. Uh, then 2008, 2009, I start really diving in. Either you're two things, either it consumes you or you're throwing yourself into work, right? right. And, and that's the best thing to do is to distract yourself and get into, into working more case. So I got into working more undercover work. I had dabbled with it before, but I had to really get into it. I let my hair grow out. I let the beard get bigger, right, that I had. I started really focusing on some of the worst criminals and really getting good informants to help me make me in the introductions to make these kind of cases. And, and that's what I talk about in my book out, out in Tampa. Uh, we dealt with some really bad repeat violent offenders. <clears throat> uh, one of them, we, I, we call him uh, Chino. I'll call him for that because I'll introduce to him through another guy. And this was in 2009, 2010 episode. This is in Pasco County, which is, if you don't know, Pasco County, it's north of Tampa uh, in Florida. And uh, just a little background on this individual. His name is in the book, but I, I just call him Chino. That's what I call him uh, when he introduced himself to me. But every, all the information, all these cases, their names are in there, public information. Uh, and people can look it up, you know, in more detail what, what I'm talking about. And uh, he was involved in a shootout with the city of Miami Police Department back in 1980. Miami. He yeah, he had drugs in the car. He was driving. He had a passenger. And they were getting pulled over. And they get a high-speed pursuit. pursuit and they start opening fire at the police officers and the police officer had slammed the brakes and they had the windows were cracked. They had fallen out of the car and he positions the vehicle in a certain way so the passenger can open up and kill the officers. Fortunately, he missed and it didn't happen. And then they keep on and they arrest him a few blocks later. In my mind, for attempted murder, two Leos, two law enforcement officers, uh, this guy should have gotten, uh, you know, life. Obviously, he had About 20 some years, almost 30 years. A little less. Yet here he is. He got out eventually and committing more violent gun crime out in Pasco County. Absolutely. 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 So, so now we're going to fast forward. This is 1980. Now we, we fast forward now to uh, 2010, 2011. It's the exact date on the book, but 2010, 2011. And uh, this other guy, I call him Short Block. Uh, his, his real name is in there. And um, he's, he's Mexican-American. The other guy's going to be Cuban-American. Or a Cuban, and uh, I get a phone call from him because I've been doing a lot, of, you know, doping guns from him, and he has a good criminal history. And he said, "Hey, we got some guns here. <clears throat> Are you interested in any?" And he goes, "Yeah, what kind of guns you have?" So oh, let me pass this guy over. And his name is Chino. So Chino okay. speaks to me in Spanish, and he told me, "Hey, we got all we got sixteen weapons here." I, I he said, and, "And they're really hot, tan caliente. That means they're stolen." Right. Oh, I said, "Oh yeah. Well, what do you have?" He told me he has long guns, he has handguns, different calibers. So I'm thinking, okay, it's like a Sunday night. I said, I got to buy some time because obviously we have logistics to do. I just can't run out there and buy it. I've got to, you know, get an operational plan. I got to get team ready. I got to get the buy money set up. So you always have to play that in there and buy yourself time. So I said, okay, give me a couple of days. Hold on to it. I'm going to buy them from you. Because I know, <clears throat> based on the other guy, he, his criminal history, but I don't know sure who this guy is yet. I know by his voice is Cuban. Uh, I want to try to identify who he is. But just by his tone, his attitude, I know he's been around the block, right? right? Right. So two days later, we negotiate the price. <clears throat> I meet these guys out there and I kind of did talk to the I worked a lot, a lot with the Pasco County detectives out in that area. I see so, you spoke very highly of them. You said that some of the best ones you've ever worked. I with. ever worked. With. We had good, good friendship with them. I mean, some of my biggest cases in that area from there. I, I worked there for uh, 12 years in that area. And we, we, we and I had to, some of the cases were briefed. Uh, I'd help dismantle one of the most violent blood sets out there, the Valentine Bloods. That, that two and a half year investigation of working with the gang detectives. Uh, outstanding. I, I can only say great things about them. They worked well. The sheriff, White at the time, had press conferences on our cases uh, at the time and, and, and taking down these bad, bad uh, 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 gangs and people that we worked. So I take a lot of pride in that. <clears throat> it's a lot of hard work, countless long hours, especially when you're the undercover. You're the case agent. You're handling all the stuff you have to go on with the case. It's it's a lot. You have to be good at multitasking. Right. So, so I mean, I have it set up. I have an undercover apartment set up in West Chapel. Small block. I've already met with him a few times there. So he, so, he knows what it is. And he he has it. He has good criminal history. Uh, before I do meet with these guys there, I show, uh, I, I talk to the detective who knows the air inside and out. And I said, we know who this guy is, small block. 
and his name is it's in there uh, in my in my book. Who do you think will hand out? They said by his voice, he sounds like he's a guy in his fifties. He sounds he's Cuban because the accent while we're talking. Who do you think that would be? And we started going through pictures. Said, well, he's been seen with this guy. I said, okay. So I looked at his picture and said, what's his criminal history like? Oh, yeah, th this guy has had attempted murders on on Leos, attempted armed robberies, robberies. Uh, he, he's, he's he's atrocious criminal history, atrocious. So I said, okay, I gotta be on my game, right? Now now I know I'm dealing with attempted murders on Leo, and, and I'm uh, so I, I gotta be really careful. One slip, up, into, well, into one my, slip up, you're next. Yeah, they come, they come. Yeah, exactly. They 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 sense something's not right. I know he's gonna pack his own heat, and I got mine too. And it could get ugly in the apartment. But, I know but, the actor, a lot of guys in prison with, with criminal histories. If they're attending, they'll brag about what they're gonna go back to, and a lot of them say, you know, f the police. You know, next time I'm gonna hold court in the street, and you know what that mm -hmm. means. That yeah. means shoot it out with you. Yeah. You know, and and some of them are just talking bravado, but I you can tell the types that that mean it. They don't say it often, but when they do say it, they they're not intending to go back to prison. You know, because they know they're done if they get caught again. Yeah, the, the ones there, the quiet type, silent types. You got to be careful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, the, the guys who just bark all day, you know, they yeah. all talk. But mm -hmm. the ones that you can tell in their eyes, they're, they're serious about it. That's those are the ones who it's, it's what's between the ears. You got to be careful about. Exactly. Right? That's yep. Between the ears. So, so I already know what I'm dealing with here. It's going to be me with these two guys, right? So my apartment, I have it fully wired, right? I got it fully wired up. So for video and sound, because I, I like always to make the best thing I can for the jury, right? I, I want the prosecutor to feel comfortable and the jury to feel comfortable with it, the, the evidence they have going on in there. So that's really important for me. Okay. Oop, right? Issue. It looks all right on this side. Happened. Are you okay on that side? Yeah, you look fine. I just heard some noise. That's all like, like, uh, yeah. right there. For some reason, my computer's acting up. Hold on a second. <clears throat> I might have to take something out here. Are you going to be able to edit this out or no? Uh, we, we could just keep continue talking while you're adjusting it. I was. Wondering if you could ever get us some other pictures, especially you with the beard and the grown out hair. You're undercover days. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I sent you some. I already sent you some, right? You have a few? Yeah, we have some to work with. I'm going to start a file on you, as a matter of fact. I have to go back through all your stuff and create one file for your pictures because you're my most, you're like, actually <laughs> the most frequent guest. <laughs> so. Gotcha. Got, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially if you use it for the other show you're talking about. That would be, uh, be cool. Um, all right. So I think my computer's acting fine now. All right. So. Um, I have him, he shows up, he shows up in, in one vehicle and, and, and small block comes in another one. And, and I notice that they have a truck and they have a dresser there in the back. Center. I wonder what they have, oh, they have a big dresser in the back. I said, what's in the dresser? And they say, oh, the guns are in the dresser. Really? So, okay. So they, they bring their own little lift there, uh, to bring it inside the apartment. So they bring it in, they put it inside there and the tops were sealed. And I said, what, what did you seal the tops for? And I said, in case we stopped by the police, it couldn't open it. And all the drawers were gone inside. Doors themselves were missing. It was just the tops to the dresser. And I had would, all stuff would, in there. I would think if they if the police officer pulled them over and they couldn't open that thing, if they had consent to search or whatever, that would make them more suspicious and they'd probably call out canine or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it would have to get the right canine because it would have been guns. Right. Dr drugs they, they wouldn't have missed so in their mind they thought they're doing it smart i said okay it, it got creative that's that's fine so they they, they bring a some a, a wrench to open them up the crowbar they pop up the and all of a sudden all the all the guns start coming out and i know in these guys history each one is take them out you have the different kind of calibers handguns rifles shotguns <clears throat> and all these guns were recently reported stolen from a prominent member in paso county who works with the sheriff's office as a uh, veterinarian out there yeah helping with the horses and uh, other animals that work for the sheriff's office so important person the guns were recently stolen and uh they would give me a little background about themselves they would have a legitimate window company right, right. working on windows but when that kind of house was vacant they would you know park in the driveway go in the back like they're working whether they're going to break into your house steal your items whatever jewelry guns you have and take it out so it looks like it's a working van, right? Because right. it has a legitimate window company. 
you were you were saying that they would pull up in front of houses. They admitted to you uh, with a window van, and yeah. So oh, they pulled up the houses for the window van. What were they doing with that, Nation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, so, this was their, their MO. Yeah, they are. They have a legitimate window company, right? Fixing windows, right? right? right. But if they thought the house was vacant, because you know, at this time, two thousand eight, nine, ten, not everybody has security alarms, right? And you are dealing with a different area in Pasco County, right? So you is easily go in there, pop the windows, go inside the house, steal guns, jewelry, you know, what have you, load up the van, and, and off you go. Because if your neighbors look at it, you think, oh, okay, uh, so and so has the the window company guys out there visiting, or work out on something. So that's why it's always careful. I tell people. When you see a white van parked in the neighborhood or you see something, don't assume it's legitimate. Right, exactly. Be careful. I got a personal story. I wasn't going to tell this story, but I'll tell my own personal story because this was in Miami, very nice area uh, near uh, the falls. I don't know if you know where the falls is located. No. Near, near, maybe uh, near Pinecrest, right? Maybe you know that area. Pinecrest School, right? Yeah, very nice area, right? And no matter where you're at, right? And this is when I was living in Miami. Uh, you, ne you never know. You never people get you know broken into all the time, and but based on my job, sometimes I'll be gone for a while. I can work an area, come back, maybe have lunch or something, then go back out again and do, and do work. Right? You know, my wife is you know moving around with kids and all that, doing all that. Dallas back then, I pull back up, and I just remember thinking about this because I'm telling this story, and I see this truck parked in my driveway. Oh boy, here we go! And and I see these two guys on the roof. I was like. What the heck is this? I so, your hands on your gun now. <laughs> I, I pull up and I, I was like, and they're two Mexican guys, because you know, because they're acting the way they're talking. I, I pull up in there and he said, "What are you guys doing?" I said, "Oh, you know, we're we're looking at at the roof. You want us to come over?" I said, "Uh, no, no, I, I didn't ask for anybody to come in and look at my tile roof or anything like that. Not going to happen." And I think one of the guys was trying maybe go on the backside, and I, and I told them, "No, no, you're in the wrong house here." And they came down and said, oh, I apologize. I said, no, you're this and that. And I told them, you better leave here and uh, you're nowhere near where you're supposed to be. So they got up real nervous and left. I could hear them, oh, my God, we messed up. Yeah, you messed up big time. Get out of here. So <laughs> hit the federales house. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I can tell them all that. But uh, off they went. So you, you just never know. I tell people, you never know. Be no, careful. No, Eyes no, open. Tell them that because then you're revealing where you live and they might think you have some machine guns or something in there to come back next time. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's all it's all timing. So the neighbors would think, hey, look, he's asking people to look, look at his roof, right? And one guy's up as a scout, right? The other guy jumps in the back, right? You know that I was a jewel and art thief and the primary times I would go out, I was very, very methodical about the way I was doing it. I would go out between... 10 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, no later, because everybody's coming home from schools. Mm -hmm. 10 in the morning, the kids already went to school. The husband's at work. The kids are still at school. The wife usually went to the mall or the supermarket. They're gone. So 10 in the morning was really good, but I would never go out later than 2 o'clock. Yeah, and, and, and these guys were doing the same thing because they were in the middle of the afternoon also. Right. So I think they know people either at work, they're at school, a lot of opportunities out there. It's legitimate company. So if you call it in, yeah, oh yeah, we, we do work in that area. But they also work, they, they work on windows, but when they have time, they also work on stealing stuff too. So this is the kind of people we're dealing with in here. They'll steal your hard earned things you work hard for to buy with your hard earned money. They're stealing your stuff. They're making your life. They're, and if they would catch you in there, I wouldn't, you know, based on this history, I wouldn't doubt they would kill you too. If, you, if, if you're if someone that can take advantage of South real quick. Listen, yeah. I, I, how about this? They keep doing that in that same van. Okay, the house gets hit. The neighbors saw that it was ABC Window Company. Mm -hmm. And then that same van is reported over three or four burglaries. The burglary detectives are going to eventually go to that company and say, well, who was driving your van that day? Because right. it's reported at the scene of multiple burglaries. So right. that's kind of not even a good MO if it's their real company. Yeah. No, it's it's not good. It, it ended quickly for these guys after this, for sure. <laughs> it, it, it ended really fast. So they come in. They bring the dresser. They got all these firearms in there, 16 of them. They take them out. I'm taking a look at them. Remember, and these guys all, you know, one's a career criminal. Another one has good felony convictions. Each one is handing me the weapons so I can inspect them. They're all going in there. I take a look at them. Okay, great. Put them in the corner there. Fantastic there. I pay them the money. Boom. Here's the cash. About 4000 um, Fourth, I count 2000 I give it to Small Block. 
he gives a right to uh, Chino. Then I give him the other 2000 You know, this is easy money for them. Hey, this is $4,000. We stole this. Hey, this is a no-brainer, right, for these guys to right. do it. But it's you don't realize this is an undercover apartment. Everything's being recorded, audio, video, and have, have a cover. Team. They're throwing their lives away for four grand, basically. It is. Now, when you do that type of sting, do you have backup on the scene when you're meeting them there, like, you know, up the street? Yeah. Because yeah, he, the apartment is wired for, for sound and, and, and it's, and it's uh, wired okay. for video. So they can also hear real time what's, what my cover team can hear what's being said. You do have a cover team when you're going for the meat to make that purchase and not just you there. Right, exactly. Because I remember, I remember there was a case where there was an agent, a DEA guy, meeting uh, a, a Gus Faraci, a mob guy who was involved with a, a, a cocaine deal. And Faraci was suspicious of him, thought he might have been a Fed or a CIA or something, and murdered him. But he went to meet him alone. And I'm like, when do these guys go meet anybody alone? They're either going to have. You, you, you uh, shouldn't, but sometimes people, you know, do things they sh you know, shouldn't do, right? You shouldn't be under and alone, right? Yeah, you start feeling comfortable with somebody, I guess, and then the next thing you know, you lose your life, unfortunately. It happens. So that's the one you have to always be careful. You always got to keep that edge because you remember what's going on. You're here to gain evidence for prosecution, right? It, this is not time to, uh, other than that, to think that this is easy or this is this could always be dangerous. Always yeah. get ugly. No matter how many times you dealt with somebody, it could always get ugly. And I've dealt with people sometimes for years. And you can always think in the back of your mind, you're a bad person. You're doing some things that I would have to be careful about. We right. can be friendly, but it could turn quickly. Right. right. And you're, and you're the, you, you don't let them pick the location either. I remember we just watched a series called Fauda. I don't know if you've seen this. I think it, I think it's on Netflix. Um, and it's really how the Mossad and the yeah. Israeli Special Forces work. And this guy got himself kidnapped and, and tortured. One of the head guys of this Israeli you know, intelligence because he let his supposedly trusted informant pick the meeting location. You know, one, he picked the location, you know, where he wanted to meet him. And the apartment he had his buddies then kidnapped the handler, you know, for whatever reason, he decided not to cooperate anymore. But then he kidnaps the guy, you know, after he was about to get out of this whole thing. So I, I know that that probably affects law enforcement here is that, you know, you will never let the sort, the, the person you're going after, select the location for a meeting unless it was like, I mean, middle of the day, you know, very busy uh, area with cameras and all that. I can't even imagine. You no, I, I, always, I always pick the locations. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I always pick the location where we're, where we're meeting. Um, and if we can't agree on something, we'll find somewhere else. But it's yeah. never, never going to be on, on their terms, right? Right. Yeah, I, 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 out of their element, for sure. For sure. You, you don't want them comfortable, if you can, in all possibilities. Because, again, it's not worth your life. Again, you're, you're building a case. And it's not worth your life at, at the end. So, okay. So these guys offload the guns. I pay them. They take the dresser. They got the dolly. They take the dresser back in the truck and they come back in. And I'm thinking, okay, we have some good conversations. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking to myself, if they're going to talk about, if he's going to talk about Chino, what happened in Miami back in 1980 with a shootout with the cops of the city of Miami. Let's see what he says. You know, these guys like to talk a lot. I like to just see what they say. As a good undercover, you talk enough. But the but jury wants want to listen to them talk. They don't okay. want to listen to you talk. I want to listen to them. So, so that's one thing I did. I always talked enough, but I, the whole idea is these guys like La Bravado and like to talk and like to talk about their history. It's hard to uh, argue against their own words in front of a jury. You know, if you said it, you said it, and that's all there is to it. You're screwed. <laughs> so so we, we sit down in, in, in the living room area. It's a nice apartment. And we're, we're talking there, and uh, he starts giving me a little bit of his background. He said, oh, I heard you're looking for AK-47s. I said, yeah, I can get you those. I have a source for that. Don't worry. Uh, he was telling me that he, uh, he spent a lot of time in Tampa, and he said he just finished doing about 20-some years in Florida. Uh, he said uh, the police were trying to shoot me. They couldn't kill me. I shot at them. And he starts bragging about what happened. And I said, all right, keep on talking. We'll, we'll keep on listening to that. Keep on talking, right? <laughs> that's, 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 that's good evidence. And uh, we finished conversation. He said, oh, well, we're going to do a lot of business. I like working up here in Pasco. I feel we can do a lot of things. I said, okay, that's great. So that's fine. And uh, let me see. Here. So we, we do that. We finish. And then we do some more deals later. And about uh, a month or so later, these guys are arrested. And, and uh, Nestor Blanco will plead guilty. Uh, he had to plead first to state charges. He had to do his time there. And then federal... He ends up getting 30 years. So he's, he's a guy in his mid-50s. 
He did about 10 years in state still yeah. because he has state charges pending. And then he does another. So he, he's never going to get out. He, he's pretty much looking. I think he still has about another 25 left. Uh, he's already close to 70 years old. It's pretty much a, a life sentence for this guy. And he was a menace to the county, to the area, to law enforcement, to the citizens of that area. And I got a lot of satisfaction. But the other guy, he had lesser criminal history. He got about 70 years. But still a significant time for both these guys. It's interesting. Now, you said that they, they pled ultimately? Well, pled, yes. Okay, because I know that even if if those recordings are not used in front of a jury, the judge can certainly listen to them before he decides sentence and, and then say, you know what, these are bad actors and they had no intention of changing. So, yeah, The prosecutor tells him that everything's recorded. He, he sometimes uses certain uh, quotes that he wants, what's going on from, from that. I remember that. And, uh, yeah, I remember it, it was – in fact, one of the prosecutors on the case, I, and, I, and the ones I worked with before – he did a great job. I worked a lot of cases with him. Uh, those are some of the best prosecutors. I worked on real good ones and some real doozies. But the ones that I worked out with the Pasco cases and Tampa cases were outstanding. Yep. All right. Listen, we are going to have you back again for a series of stories about your other books as well. But this is just a s- small portion of mm. Eight Step Undercover. Phenomenal book. How many books have you written now, by the way? Because <laughs> I know it's over 60, I think. 62. 62 books. 62 books. Let's close this one out. Whatever else you want to say about this particular book All right, and how me... to find it and everything, and then we'll get on to part two. Yeah, that, that, that's just one or a few, two stories. Plenty out there. If you like what you heard, please go check it out on Amazon, ATF Undercover. You can see my poster behind me. Uh, it just, and if you're not a big reader, it's on Audible. And I think you would say that uh, you know the uh, voice actor, Sean Milo, did a great job on it. Nice voice to listen to. Great story. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of ATF. Not just by buying dope and guns, but things have to deal with with uh, uh, issues with bad prosecutors, bad supervisors, and uh, my own personal life, as I talked about, dealing with the death of my father, tragic death, and how you overcome things like that in your life, and you still become extremely successful. I, I tell you what, one of the take, <clears throat> takeaways I got, I thought it was going to be – like re- rehashing, you know, your glory, your glory points and, you know, all these wonderful cases you've made and things you're proud of. But uh, I, I think one of the big takeaways I have was somebody who comes from your background telling the truth about issues of malfeasance and, you know, maybe even some corruption within ATF yeah. and U.S. Attorney's Office. And you're just you just retired from ATF not long ago. So coming from you, you know, we appreciate that. We know that there's uh, some ATF, uh, or excuse me, FBI whistleblowers coming forward now on some other matters. All right, so Ignacio, thank you so much for coming on again. We love hearing about this book. Um, my takeaway was the insights you have as to certain, not just cases, you know, for salacious, you know, content, but you're also got into the inner workings of ATF and the drama behind the scenes, even some good, bad, and the ugly, as you call it, and the uh, yeah. mass of reasons that goes on. So we know that there's FBI whistleblowers coming forward in another case right now that they're going forward to Congress on some matters. Um, and so you're not necessarily a whistleblower, but you seem like a guy who's tried to rise above it and uh, do the right thing your entire career. And you've been penalized for it a couple of times. And so we appreciate you sharing that stuff. Anything else you'd like to say about this book and uh, closing yeah, out? This I, 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 I appreciate the comments, Bill. I'm, I'm glad that you and Mary liked it. Um, I'm hoping that the Audible that came out, uh, again, shout out to Sean Milo, excellent voice actor. If you like Audible books, I think you'll like this one. And I got two more coming out, hopefully in the next couple months or so, uh, based on organized crime and the other one with killers and tyrants, uh, you know, based on books, a series that I have written on these very lengthy, uh, I think it'll be over six, seven hours. Uh, this was about two hours. So you'll really get an enjoyment of that and, uh, the stories and what's going on. Uh, so if you like that, I think, um, it'll be a lot more things you'll like about ATF undercover and what I have to say. And it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. It's out there. That's the government we have. It, to, to be successful, and that's in anywhere in life, you have to adapt and overcome. You have to overcome your obstacles. You've got to be successful. You can't let these people try to break you or, 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 or become obstructionists. And that's what I think they were, obstructionists. And I had to overcome them and, and adapt to them. And I talk a lot more stuff about the supervisor. Hopefully we have another show we can talk about those too. All right. Now check out Ignacio's books. All the links are in the descriptions. 
uh, in the description section. And we're also on Rumble. We, we're going pretty strong on Rumble as well. Please hit like and subscribe. Share this channel around. I'm trying to build this out a little bit more. And thank you so much for joining William Steele True Crime. Check out my podcast. Check out Ignacio's books. And thank you again for stopping by, Ignacio. We'll see you again soon. All right, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. You're welcome. True Crime Community Trending Viral. Another phenomenal guest with William Steele. Welcome to William Steele True Crime. Thank you for joining my True Crime channel and podcast if you're listening in. And uh, thank you to all the fans that I, I've developed through my participation in the uh, docuseries Inmate to Roommate on A&E Network. Uh, thank you, A&E Network and Sharp Entertainment uh, for including me in this journey. Um, also, I would like anybody who's new to this to uh, please hit like and subscribe. I'm still trying to build my numbers up, and uh, hopefully you guys will join me in this journey post-incarceration to uh, tell crime victim uh, stories, uh, inspirational stories of men that were released from prison and turned their life around. They're writing books now. They're doing good things. And we have a whole bunch of different stories. You know, We have reformed gangsters. We have law enforcement. We have an ATF agent, retired Ignacio Esteban, that comes on here regularly. And um, so we always try to look for very special guests with an insider's perspective on things with a good outlook. And uh, so I'll introduce my, my current guest now. Uh, Laura Leone Coolio is my current guest. Now, let me tell you a little something about Laura. Um, my recollection is she was a fan of Inmate to Roommate. She looked my stuff up. Well, we got in touch. She purchased both of my books. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, and it comes to find come to find out, so she has a very, very special uh a career and background and credentials. Now, she's uh, formerly at the U.S. Attorney's Office, which is the Federal Prosecutor's Office in California. I, I'll leave it to her if she wants to say exactly where. But uh, so in California, she was part of the Federal Prosecutor's Office. She was uh, and in with the Civil Financial Litigation Section. She was an investigative analyst. And she's also a certified fraud examiner, which my fiance, Dr. Mary Bass, is as well. And my, my fiance is an accountant and a forensic forensic accountant. Um, so Laura has very similar credentials, and she has an MBA, an MA, a BSB. I guess that's an accounting, and she's an Air Force veteran. So she's done a lot, you know, for the public good and for and for other people. And I'm just thrilled to have her as a fan. And you know <laughs> that she bought my books. I ask everybody else, please check out my books too. Because that's how I'm trying to earn an honest living these days and telling these stories. So with that, I introduce Laura Leone. Julio, <laughs> on camera with me now. Thank you for joining us, Laura. Thanks for having me, Bill. And yes, that's right. I did buy both of your books, and I'm a big fan. I, I watched your show, and, you know, I, I really love true crime. And, you know, that's obviously why I have that background. I just, I fell in love with, you know, I, I, I used to binge watch Law and Order back in the 90s and <laughs> kind of just, you know, fell in love with that and, and actually ended up getting an accounting degree and uh, doing some tax auditing and then jumped over to the DOJ side about 11 years ago. And, you know, as far as being a, a victim uh, advocate, I just want to thank you for doing that because that's that's not an easy job and it's not easy to, you know, be a platform and, you know, give a basically a, a place for these victims to speak and to get their stories out and, you know, in the public, because a lot of times they they kind of maybe get a shot in court to kind of, you know, tell their their side of it. And that that's if they have the money to, you know, go there and travel and, you know, follow it and all that. So I, I just want to thank you for doing this because it, it means a lot to these victims and. Um, you know, so I really appreciate that. And uh, well, I, appreciate, I appreciate your, your, your recognizing that, you know, with my background, you know, I served 18 years for nonviolent crimes. And, uh, you know, I really always had a heart for victims because my mother was mentally ill and all through my childhood, you know, her being picked on and, you know, bullied around here and there and, you know, abused various places. I would be only, always the person standing up for her. So it was ingrained to me to stand up for others, even though I went bad myself uh, for a while because I developed a cocaine addiction. Um, you know, it doesn't, it didn't change the heart I had inside behind all that. So I thank you for recognizing that. And, you know, if, I, I'd like you to really start this off if you could, by telling us a little more about yourself, maybe your background, where you're from originally. Um, you know, when you, when you were a child, did you always want to be an accountant? Did you love math when you were a little kid? You know, mm -hmm. how, how does somebody come to love math? Personally, I could barely count <laughs> and add. <laughs> 
you know, I'm good at making money. I'm horrible at keeping track of it. My my, my fiance Mary, she's uh she's wonderful at all that, you know. And so, tell me about you. You know, did you love accounting and math when you were a kid? Not not necessarily, but you know, my dad was an accountant, tax auditor, and uh, he he did audits with the state. Anything from sales tax to you know fuel tax, any kind of business taxes and kind of just followed in his footsteps I guess uh, you know math came easy to me and and um, I just said you know what I my dad kind of always had that, that kind of accounting job and said, I know I can do it let me try it out and so after I got out of the Air Force I had my um, bachelor's in accounting and uh, started you know started with the tax accounting and kind of just went from there and and really grew to have a you know fondness and love for the, you know, the DOJ and the DOJ mission and um, kind of got in as a, well, got in as a civil, uh, civil investigator, because, you know, a lot of people know about the the agents with the guns and the criminal and, you know, the FBI, you know, and agencies would bring us the evidence and uh, we had, you know, U.S. Marshals and things like that, and they would go seize assets and evidence. But um, I'm, I'm more like, you know, like how you said, forensic accountant, like person behind the person and uh, basically collecting judgments and criminal restitution, fines, uh, anything that is owed to either a victim or the gov government. And a victim can be individuals, it can be businesses, it can be um, state agencies, federal, other federal agencies. And it, there's an array of cases from blue collar to white collar. So I don't, I don't know where your focus is, but I can talk about either of them, anything from drugs to predators to right. tax fraud, any, and Ponzi schemes, you know, like. Well, we're going to, we're going to get into that because my true crime audience, most of them are aware that it was the taxes and the books and everything that brought Al Capone down. So yes, you're, yes, the, I per have you're the person a criminal needs to fear when it comes to their money and their assets and losing the, getting the ill-gotten gains seized back <laughs> So yeah. let, me ask, let me ask you this. I know Mary's a forensic accountant. I don't see that on the bio. Is that, is that, you said you would like one or you actually certify as a forensic accountant somewhere? No, I'm not. No, I'm only certified as a fraud examiner, but um, I do a lot of basically, you know, investigative forensic type work. So forensic yeah. type work. Okay. So yeah. it's a similar thing. All right. Um, so yeah. Get into some of the cases. I know, you know, in talking to you, getting to know you over the last few months, you actually had cases pretty, pretty, big cases that people would know that were profiled on American Greed. Um, mm -hmm. It was a pretty popular show about crime. And so you're behind some of these cases. And, and uh, I think you were interviewed for them where your cases were included on them. Tell us, pick, pick like one or two cases and let us know something that you've actually worked on that people might know or could look up. Yeah. So, so one big one that is somewhat recent is actually the Wanakawati case, and it's it's a very long name, but I'm going to read it off here. W-A-N-N-A-K-U-W-A-T-T-E, Wanakawati. And uh, Mr. Wanakawati from roughly 2002 to 2014 uh, had 200 individual victims. And so this is the highest priority in, you know, cases and collections and things like that. And it was it was really, really odd because he actually overstated his income and you're, you're, we're talking 230 million here. So this is a very large, you know, amount. Right. And he even overstated his income, in fact, so much that he overstated it on the taxes, too. So, you know, because he wanted to look very profitable to get these people to, you know, invest in his company, invest in his business and uh, he, he took, it wasn't publicly traded. So, you know, it's a, a it's a non-publicly traded, uh, small business. And so he really, he cooked the books so extremely that it was kind of weird because he actually overstated his income and <laughs> so way overstated by multi-million dollars right. in multiple years. Generally, they don't do, generally what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll understate it on the tax side and pay way less taxes or get a huge tax refund and then overstate it everywhere else, you know, in their profit and loss statement. It sounds and, like you were trying to almost unwittingly or wittingly co-op the IRS to uh, under underwrite his scams, you know, by saying, well, look, right, you know, what I've you know, made. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, that was that. Meanwhile, it triggers a million red flags. Like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 
So the question is, you know, so it's kind of weird because in that kind of situation, instead of getting a huge tax refund, he would actually be paying, overpaying, which is really weird, but it's still incorrect. You know, it's still the incorrect amount reported, whether whether you're getting ta money back or you owe taxes, doesn't matter. And so in in five years of doing tax audits, it's actually six and a half, but, um, and then, you know, 11 years of doing this, this work, um, financial collections, um, I, I had never heard of or seen anyone that is overstated, especially that much money. You know, generally they will lie on a loan application to the bank, you know, to kind of like overstate, I make 10,000 a month in my business instead of 2000. Um, generally that's where they'll cook the books cause it's kind of informal and, you know, it helps them get loans. They're basically not supposed to get. Now, now when they do that, does the bank, if they catch it before they issue a loan, are they obligated to turn it over to you guys or just say no and don't come back again? Are the banks turning these things over to, over to the, to the government to investigate? Look, this, this, this is not true. We found out on our own. This is not accurate. Yeah, they're supposed to because there are task force that, you know, look for these kind of anomalies. So part of that would be, you know, working with the banks or the credit unions and they have filing requirements under the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, I just have to say I'm not an attorney, but I know that's under Title 31. And under Title 31, the Bank Secrecy Act creates a lot of information sharing and, you know, task force things that we can, uh, basically information that we can access and that if they, you know, they literally need a phone line to call someone at the feds, hey, this person looks like they're doing money laundering and huge tax fraud, like, one, you know, like one Kawadi maybe would have had 300 bank bank accounts with all kinds of crazy transactions. Like that's really obvious, but you know, I'm just, I'm just giving an example. Um, they, they would literally have a phone line or a phone contact, like on a task force, you know, so-and-so at FBI, um, so-and-so at us attorneys, so-and-so at, um, you know, superior court, you know, things like that, white collar, you know, task force or blue collar task force, um, um, child predator task force kind of just depends on the category DEA, you know, drugs, but, um, drug cases might also be, you know, um, other things, or it might be white collar and blue collar. So, so every bank branch would have, or their supervisory, you know, office, regional office would have a direct number to the exact task force that investigates that crime and say, Hey, we have another one, you know, check it out. How does that come into play? Now we'll get back to Wanakwadi in a minute. On SARS, a uh, suspicious activity report, you know, that's the $10,000 thing you always hear about. Mm -hmm. Does that concern you guys at all? Or is that something? Yeah, that's part of that. That's part of that. So that that those reporting requirements by financial institutions are part of that Title 31, the Bank Secrecy Act. So they have to have, like, there are certain requirements that financial institutions, which I say financial institutions in quotes because... If you buy a car with cash at a car dealer, that's considered a financial institution under the Bank Secrecy Act because you're, you know, triggering a certain amount um, or cash equivalents like a cashier's check, for example, or a money order. And so if I walk into a 20,000 in the car dealer and say, I want to buy this with cash, 20,000, there's going to be some some kind of um, form that should be triggered by that, um, good or bad. You know, it might be a criminal, you know, using uh, like a Wanakwadi type using, you know, money that doesn't belong to them from victims that they stole and they're going to buy, you know, a car in cash. So it needs to be flagged. It might be total legitimate. And, you know, I saved this up in my savings for 10 years and that's my money or an inheritance. So, right. but, um, you know, so, so that's why I say financial institutions, most of the time it is banks or cash checking places. Um, not always can be car dealers, um, but yes, th this all funders all falls under the bank secrecy act that title 31, and they also are required, especially banks, to have an anti-money laundering um, section, you know, that actually, you know, administers this. And if the feds or state, you know, task force call and need information, uh, they are limited to what they can hand out without a subpoena. But there's there's generally a little bit of information sharing and, you know, an analyt analytical sharing that we can do. But obviously we have to get a subpoena if we need like, you know, full blown records or, you know, like if we need a video of the person coming in the bank or, you know, something like that. This is Laura Leone and I'm selling Conscious Kid Adventures with Zane in a booth at a local fair in Sacramento. Hi. 
Bye.
Thank you very much, everybody. with Zane in a booth at a local fair in Sacramento. Bye. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your support. Please remember, hit the like and subscribe button now. Thank you for joining Steal a Spotlight with Rudy Cashman and Dr. Jerome Onomala. There you go. He pronounced it. I'm working on it. Yeah.